visual snow syndrome is now far more widely recognised in the medical community uh, than it was. It's, it's now accepted as an entity by the, the majority of responsible medical opinion. Now, as everybody is aware, uh, and I became very aware of this when I went to the first conference in San Francisco, the vast majority of patients, I think there were about 800 there, had been told by somebody that they were crazy and by somebody else that they had migraine that was untreatable. And that was just ridiculous. Uh, there was too much stereotypy for that to be the case. So since 1995, uh, when Grant Liu uh, identified six patients that had this stereotypic uh, syndrome that was not vascular, uh, to, to now, the growth of awareness of uh, visual snow syndrome is uh, largely due to patient organisation and the Visual Snow Initiative being the first truly effective organisation and the encouragement of research and the searching out of people like Peter Goadsby and Christoph Schenken, uh, Victoria Pellack, uh, uh, our own group, myself, Joe Fielding, uh, Claire Fraser in Sydney, um, a number of people who, uh, not necessarily including myself, are listened to by the medical community. It's also been the development of overwhelming uh, evidence that this is a physiological abnormality, not a psychological abnormality. So uh, there has been increasing acceptance, partly because this has been presented at meetings, partly because uh, other doctors have said, oh, I don't want to see visual snow, they're crazy. And so they've sent them along to people like us, which has really just fed the mill in that we've had more and more and more patients to look at and more and more evidence collected. So it's, it's been uh, partly the, a small group of people who have been doing, doing research. But the big thing has been the organisation of the patient group and the Visual Snow Initiative efforts. And that can't be underestimated because... This has moved in 29 years more than some diseases have moved in 100 years. I mean, Parkinson's disease, it took almost 70 years before people accepted that it was a real thing. You know, so it, it needs to be seen in that perspective. We've really learned everything we know about VSS in the past 25 years. Everything. Uh, prior to that, it was written off, firstly, as a very rare entity. And in fact, in the international headache classification, it was called a rare entity. Uh, uh, what we have learnt is that it is a stereotypical uh, set of symptoms that go together, uh, that it can be associated with uh, other areas of dysfunction. Uh, we have learnt um, that... There are characteristic uh, abnormalities we can identify on investigation uh, and that we have parameters for determining whether or not a therapy uh, is effective. We have determined a number of therapies that have some effect but not global effect. We've gone from ignorance to almost understanding. I think that actually you need to go from, if we look at, the, at, at what the progression from recognising that there is something wrong to actually curing it, firstly you have to understand the underlying mechanisms, secondly you have to understand what might interact with it, thirdly you have to understand how you can measure it, fourthly you then have to try out things that uh, might have an effect on, on the function. And we've really come an enormous way. We've developed, I think, a solid theory as to how this happens. Uh, there's always a tendency because of our past history to try and localise this, but in fact, it's not local. It, it's within networks, and networks are far flung by definition. Uh, I think uh, we've got to the point where we have recognised uh, that it is a, a distinct entity, uh, we understand somewhat the physiology and the lack of anatomy related to it. Uh, 
we are at the point where we can probably measure the deficit and measure the effects of therapies. And I think uh, that over the next two to five years, I am really hopeful that we will have satisfactory therapies for the majority of people with visual snow syndrome. I do not think we will ever fix everybody. It's like almost any other disorder. We don't fix everybody. But uh, an analogy, I think, would be post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's an analogy in more ways than one because it is also an abnormality of central processing. Uh, the conventional therapies had about a 10% success rate. I would hope that with the... Uh, I don't think we'll need hallucinogens for, for that because uh, uh, they're actually deleterious in visual snow syndrome. Uh, but I do think that we will develop techniques which I hope would work in over 60% of, uh, of patients. Firstly, it will be severity of deficit, okay? Uh, and uh, we may not be able to um, train people up in the same way that we can't train everybody to be an, Olymp an, an Olympic athlete. Uh, secondly, uh, there are people who have interactive pathologies because we know that anxiety and depression and attentional disorders occur in parallel uh, but, uh, but uh, separate from this and I think those interactive uh, pathologies may uh, mean that some people just can't do the work that's involved in terms of the retraining. Uh, so I, uh, you know, 100% is the aim uh, my suspicion is that you'll be able to reduce the intensity of the pathology in, uh, or, the, or the dysfunction in the majority of people, but whether you can reduce it to a level where they're satisfied with it, I think that two-thirds, uh, three-quarters would be uh, considered a major advantage. We've, uh, for some time in the laboratory, been looking at a wide range of neurological disorders uh, by uh, using the visual ocular motor system as a means of uh, evaluating, firstly, whether the system was functioning uh, normally, secondly, if it was abnormal, providing a marker of how abnormal it was, and uh, thirdly, being able to follow changes over time. Now, as I said, this is predicated on uh, the fact that about 53% of networks, maybe slightly more, are involved in vision and control of eye movements, and they're widely distributed throughout the brain, such that they're susceptible to pathology in around about 80% of the brain, which is way beyond anything else that we have. Uh, they are more sensitive to abnormality of function, for instance, than MRI is by orders of magnitude. And, and much cheaper. But this has all been done with research-grade equipment. So for quite some time, we've been trying to design uh, a piece of equipment that uh, would be relatively uh, inexpensive and certainly very mobile. Now, when I say inexpensive, I'm talking in terms of what medical equipment uh, usually costs. The use is, is, is um, generalised on the basis that you can do many patients with it. So it's not a big cost, uh, amortised over three or four years. And the equipment we've uh, developed would be based on video um, goggles, uh, VR goggles, video reality goggles, uh, with cameras built into them that will sample at uh, a sufficient uh, speed that we can actually define the eye movements. Uh, at this point in time, uh, we have prototype equipment and we're at the point of validating um, the uh, results with th that equipment by comparison with our research grade equipment to show that we have the same degree of sensitivity and the same results. So uh, in the next couple of years, so we would anticipate that that would be more readily available. In terms of its utility, it's more like taking a temperature to see whether somebody's got, or, or measuring a blood sugar with a patch on the arm, or measuring a heart rate, okay? So you're getting a reflection of function. Um, the Apple Vision goggles don't sample fast enough. 
uh, and the requirement for what we do is to blank out the environment so that we can actually specifically control everything that they're seeing. We're looking at uh, two years, I think, maybe two and a half years. That's, that's what we're aiming at. Um, as you know, aim is always uh, short of, um, or achievement is always short of aim. But certainly in the next two or three years, we look at it being generalised uh, in, in clinics uh, for uh, a diagnosis of, uh, or an, an assessment of uh, new, new therapies, uh, for assessment of progression in patients, for assessment of the effect of therapy in patients. Well, we've already established its uh, value in progressive small vessel disease in the brain. Uh, Parkinson's disease, uh, degenerative diseases in general. Uh, we can show abnormalities in autism spectrum disorders. Um, there are abnormalities in schizophrenia. Um, the big one, of course, is uh, Alzheimer's disease. Can we show abnormalities in Alzheimer's disease? Yes, we can. Well, in, in fact, what, what that technology does is assesses brain function. So almost anything that affects the brain will have uh, abnormalities in uh, function in the visual oculomotor system. So we have uh, very extensive data in multiple sclerosis in terms of sensitivity to picking up abnormality, sensitivity to change over time, and uh, responses to medication. Uh, to the extent that we've been able to demonstrate that we are far more sensitive to change in MS than MRI is. Uh, we also have data in degenerative diseases such as uh, Parkinson's disease and Huntington's disease, uh, as well as small vessel disease in the brain, which can commonly be a cause of uh, vascular dementia, which is the second most common uh, dementia uh, known. Uh, there is uh, long-standing evidence of abnormality in eye movements in Alzheimer's disease. Now. Alzheimer's disease presents uh, the particular, a particular difficulty, which I think we discussed informally in the past. But the reality is that it starts in 80% of cases in a very small localized area of the brain and then spreads cell by cell by cell by cell by cell. Like most diseases, including MS uh, and vascular disease, it starts many years before it actually becomes clinically evident. One of the maxims of, in, in neurology, and evidence has been present in all diseases, that early diagnosis and early treatment improves outcomes. Early diagnosis is hard, uh, and late diagnosis is hard to treat. So we're, we're, we're trying to develop systems where we can diagnose it early because we can, we're very sensitive to minor changes and potentially uh, we can start treatment much earlier. The delays to uh, implementation are validating that we can uh, reproduce all the same results on, on the new equipment. Uh, and then of course you have to get uh, FDA and European approval as well as for us Australian approval for the, for the device which shouldn't be a problem beyond the, the paperwork issue because it's non-invasive and uh, it, it, can do, it can do no harm. So. Uh, I, that'll all take a couple of years.